Our next speaker will be, uh, her topic is analyzing and optimizing denitrification hotspots in Minnesota's surface water. Um, Abigail Thomasek received her master's degree in environmental and water resources engineering from the University of Texas and is now a second year PhD student in civil engineering at the University of Minnesota. And Uh, hello, I am Abigail Tomasek, and today I'll be talking about my work on denitrification hotspots in Minnesota surface. Oh, is it not working? Oh, talk to the microphone. This microphone. Okay. <laughs> oh, did that not? Okay, well, I'll just start on this slide, I guess. But the previous slide, it uh, showed a picture of my field site, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with since it's an agricultural landscape, an agricultural ditch. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, but um, how does nitrate get into our surface waters? So in agricultural landscapes like what I'm dealing with, uh, there's large applications of fertilizer, um, and it's quickly, and usually in the form of ammonia. And ammonia is quickly turned into nitrate, which is a highly mobile form of nitrogen. Uh, and nitrate can be de directly delivered to surface waters through tile drainage, or can infiltrate into groundwater. Am I not doing something right? Maybe I'll just put it down, and then. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so um, about nitrogen in Minnesota, uh, the picture at left is from a study from the MPCA. Uh, the dots re represent the 90th, mean, 90th percentile of mean concentrations. Um, and as you can see, uh, in the agricultural south, there's a lot of very high concentrations marked by red. Um, the study found that approximately 70% of nitrate statewide is from crop and agriculture. And in the Minnesota basin where our field site is located, this can be as high as 90 to 95%. Um, so that dot where represents where our field site is. So you can see it's in a sea of red. Um, Minnesota is also one of the largest exporters of nitrate to the Mississippi River. So this kind of goes off of uh, Sarah Rowley's talk. But um, as you can see in the Midwest, there's large nitrogen inputs. And this is of importance since this area drains to the Mississippi. And, um, is in the nitrate loading in the Mississippi River is the predominant cause of the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, which as of 2013 was about the size of Connecticut. Um, this represents the nitrate, mean nitrate concentrations uh, at our field site from 20, 2002 to 2011. And as you can see, these concentrations were routinely, routinely uh, greater than the drinking water standard of 10 milligrams per liter. So this project looked at a part of the nitrogen cycle called denitrification. Denitrification is an anaerobic process performed predominantly by heterotrophic bacteria. And in aquatic systems, this can be viewed as a nitrate sink, since it converts nitrate into inert, inert nitrogen gas, which can be released to the atmosphere. Um, one important thing to keep in mind when looking at this process is incomplete denitrification stops at nitrous oxide, which is a very strong greenhouse gas. So what are hotspots? Um, Small moment or small areas termed hotspots in short time periods termed hot moments have shown, been shown to account for a high percentage of denitrification relative to the surrounding area. Um, these hotspots have been found to, to uh, occur at the convergence of ideal values of parameters such as organic matter, moisture content, anoxic sediments, um, high residence times, and established bacterial communities. So our overall project goals are to identify and quantify these drivers of denitrification hotspots, and then how these parameters can be modified to increase the microbial communities that cause these hotspots, um, with the ultimate goal of providing a set of management guidelines uh, to agricultural surface waters to promote and enhance uh, hotspots that are already occur, and to um, create, uh, create these hotspots in the landscape. And again, this picture is from our field site. Uh, they were combining when we were out there. <laughs> Got hit in the head with corn occasionally. <laughs> um, so uh, one thing that's unique with this project is we're looking at also at the microbial uh, side of denitrification. Um, so uh, individual genes code for each step in denitrification, uh, shown in the denitrification is in the red part of this figure. And this project 
uh, looks at the genes circled in yellow here. Um, and then we're also looking at the abundance of a gene called 16S RNA, which is coded for by, all, or codes for all bacteria. So then by comparing the abundance of these genes to uh, 16S RNA, we can find an approximate percentage of the microbial community that's composed of, or denitrifiers. What percent of denitrifiers uh, account for the overall microbial community? So we're looking at this by uh, using DNA extraction and qPCR. Um, we measured potential denitrification in the soils uh, using a method called the denitrification enzyme activity assay. Um, this was done by adding field sediment and site water to wheat and bottles, uh, creating a slurry, um, purging with helium gas since denitrification requires anoxic conditions. You then add a settling gas which stops, oops, stops denitrification at nitrous oxide. And then you can measure the accumulation of nitri nitrous oxide over time to get uh, a value for the rate of denitrification. So our field site is located in Seven Mile Creek. You can kind of see it's the small yellow area there, uh, which is located in the Minnesota River Basin. The zoomed in picture of our site, or of our watershed. Um, so during field sampling, we targeted three sites. Two sites located in a predominantly agricultural area, and one site in a downstream, more natural setting, uh, which is located in a, in a city park, right before the confluence with the Minnesota River. The two upstream sites were uh, targeted for a cross-sectional analysis. Um, the mid-banks, one was in the stream channel itself, one was at a mid-bank site that would um, ideally periodically be inundated, and an upper bank site that would ideally never be flooded. And so the purpose of this was to look at the effect of flooding and um, moisture content and periodic flooding on the rates of denitrification. And these sites were sampled, oh, uh, all right, it's going. <laughs> <laughs> Backtrack a little bit. Okay. Okay. Well. <laughs> um, well, I can. <laughs> I, uh, I'm not really sure what to do about that. But um, so yeah. <laughs> maybe if I just stop there. Does that work? Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> these sites were sampled in June, August, and October. Um, SM2 is the furthest upstream site, and as you can see, there's highest rates in the stream um, in June, with lower rates in August and October. Uh, the mid-bank site at this site was highest in June, um, with lower but similar rates in August and October. And the upper bank site had similar rates across the season at SM2. At SM1, which is um, the mid site, which is also located in an agriculture area, uh, rates in the stream were highest in June again, with low rates in August and October. And uh, the mid-bank and upper bank site had similar values across the season and to each other. Um, the park site was only sampled in the stream, and as I mentioned, it was in a more natural setting. Um, rates were low in June and October and had highest rates in August. Um, we think probably the reason for the very low rates in August and October in the stream at SM2 and SM1 are due to their really low nitrate concentrations. If you look at the graph uh, in June, these values were between 45 and 30 milligrams per liter, which was very high. And in August and October, they were below 0.1. They were very low. Um, and at the park site, uh, high, there were high nitrate concentrations, we think, due to the groundwater influx at this site. Um, if you look at SM2, though, you see that the mid-bank site had high rates in June. Um, I, we think this is probably due to channel geometry. So SM1 had uh, a trapezoidal channel, typical of most agricultural ditches. Um, at SM2, the mid-bank site was located in, in a small, almost pseudo floodplain that would periodically get flooded. And um, as you can see in June, there's high nitrate concentration. So as you periodic, periodically flood this site with high nitrate concentrations, you could increase rates and increase maybe uh, the heterotrophic bacteria at this site. And the park site um, had high rates in August. Uh, one thing to note is the June sampling was done before the extensive flooding in Minnesota. I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with that, but there is very large floods. And um, the percents are, or the values are the percent of organic matter. And um, in August, this value was much higher, probably due to the delivery of organic matter from the flood. And since they are heterotrophic bacteria, they require organic matter. And as Sarah really mentioned, there's been uh, correlations between high organic matter and high rates. So yeah, in June, the site was predominantly cobble, was very fast flowing, was pretty deep. And then in August, oh, and there's fines only located in small areas around the bank. In August, this, the site was predominantly fines, was much slower flowing, and had lower depth. 
So as I mentioned, these sites change dramatically across the season. Um, SM2 was the furthest upstream site. In June, the depth was about 60 centimeters and the velocity was about, I think, 55 centimeters per second. And in October, this site was, had changed into very shallow, po almost stagnant pools. Mm -hmm. And so I think the velocity was close to 0 0.0, 0 0.3 centimeters a second. And then as I mentioned, the park site cha also changed dramatically. Uh, the left picture is looking upstream from a bridge and the right picture is looking downstream at the same bridge. Um, velocities in June were about uh, 35 centimeters a second. In October, they're about five centimeters a second. Um, so now a little bit about the Outdoor Stream Lab experiments. Uh, the Outdoor Stream Lab, as the name suggests, is an ex outdoor experimental stream located at the St. Anthony Falls Lab, which is the building in this picture. Um, it's driven by the river, water from the Mississippi River, which is then delivered out to the end of it. Um, it's a semi-closed system since there's a groundwater barrier, so there's no inflow from outside, <coughs> outside sources. Um, the sediment is recirculated, so you have control over what type of sediment goes into the channel. And so this is great for projects such as mine where you rely on bacteria. Um, you can test these things in flumes, but you don't have the influence of the environmental conditions. So this allows you um, to have and they're hard to scale to the natural conditions. So this allows us to have some control over the nat natural systems and test for these processes. So um, during these, for the, these experiments were performed to determine the effect of flooding on denitrification. So we've performed two floods, one in late June, one in early July. And for each flood, the entire floodplain was inundated with about five centimeters of water for approximately four hours. Uh, we chose a transect with two sites located in the stream channel itself and with three sites located on the floodplain. Um, these sites were sampled one immediately before the flood, immediately post the flood, after the flood, one day post flood, and three days post flood. Um, for each sampling, soil cores were taken and to measure the potential denitrification. Uh, the gene abundance using qPCR, um, measurements for bulk density, organic matter, moisture content along with the nitrate concentration in the water and dissolved oxygen me measurements. Oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, the left site um, represents the meander of the OSL under normal flow conditions, and the right shows um, under flooded conditions. And so these are the results that we found from the outdoor stream lab. Um, at, similar to the field results, uh, rates were very low in the channel with higher rates seen on the floodplain. This was also seen, so the left is the first flood and the second is the, or the right is the second flood. Um, so rates were similar for each sampling date across the floodplain, um, but they were seen during the first flood, they seemed to peak one day post flood. Um, this was probably due to the nitrate concentrations of the water that we flooded the floodplain with. So um, during the first flood, this was around one milligram per liter, and during the second, it was around 0.5. And some literature has suggested in riverine systems that nitrate becomes limited from about 0.4 to 0.9 milligrams per liter. So if we inundate the floodplain with high nitrate waters, we could potentially increase denitrification rates. Also, um, I, we think the difference between the channel and the floodplain is again due to differences in the organic matter. And the channel itself, uh, organic matter averaged about 0.5%, and on the floodplain it's averaged about 5%. And so bringing this all together, um, Denitrification is a complex process which is controlled by a lot of variables. Uh, this table represents the, what the trends we've seen with each potential value, variable. So um, we saw with increasing rates of denitrification corresponded to decreases in bulk density, increases in organic matter, increases in moisture content, decreases in shear velocity, and increased nitrate concentrations. And so the goal of this project was to find an overall equation relating all of these trends. So we used dimensionless, dimensional analysis to find one overall trend for these variables. Um, and with this, you could hopefully create a model with easily measurable field conditions that you could then extrapolate a potential rate. So this is the graph um, of our best fitting trend line for the overall trend. Um, one thing to note is that these only represented the channel samples. Um, we're currently working on a correlation for bank samples along with this. So um, this was preliminary results from flume experiments. <laughs> I think I'm going a little fast. From flume experiments last spring. So we had a flume and 
took field sediment and field water um, and amended the sediment with two types of carbon and changed the velocity over time. And we found that by amending the sediment, we could potentially increase denitrification rates. And um, in the future, we're going to try and we amended with two types of carbon. And um, this spring, we're going to rerun the experiments to see if we see, again, maybe a difference with amending different types of the sediment with different types of carbon. And we saw um, a preliminary result of increasing velocities, uh, increasing denitrification, but some results suggested maybe there is an upper limit of this increased velocity. So future work, we're gonna continue with the microbial work. Um, we've gotten proto finalized protocols and found some values for gene abundance, but we're going to continue with this. Um, we're also, like I mentioned, we're gonna continue with the laboratory flume experiments. Um, go back out to Seven Mile Creek and see if similar trends were seen. And again, to see if temporal, see the temporal variations. Um, do more OSL flooding and also this summer work with the small scale basins and the OSL to determine the effect of flooding frequency and duration on denitrification. So with that, I would like to acknowledge my funding sources. Um, I was funded by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and uh, along with the work that uh, the microbiologists and help with the lab from these people. So with that, <laughs> I think I've got plenty of time for questions. <laughs> I think I went a little fast, but yes, please ask away on questions. So thank you. Yes. Is there any relationship between water temperature and your rate of denitrification? Um, kind of. I, we did record water temperature, but I haven't looked at that as a parameter yet. Um, I'm assuming that that would affect it since most bacteria is, most bacterial rates are slowed with colder water temperatures. And so, uh, we're also planning on looking at sediment temperature since that would also affect rates. But no, I haven't actually looked at that directly yet. Any other questions? <laughs> We also saw, we actually saw a decrease um, in field conditions with increasing shear velocity. Um, so this relationship I had, uh, that first number represents the Reynolds number, or like, so, and we found a decreasing trend with denitrification rates in, um, with uh, the Reynolds number. Um, it was only in the, field, the flume experiments that we saw with increasing velocity, and I think that probably with increased velocity you increase diffusion into the sediments. So I, I think what you might see is maybe a, some kind of like, up to an asymptotic value. And so like maybe by increasing, having very slow velocities, but still some velocity, you would increase diffusion, but up to a t like a certain rate, you'd have too high of a shear velocity and start to de decrease denitrification. That's at least my assumption, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, <laughs> oh, yep. Yeah. How much demand is there for the outdoor screen lab? You should talk to Jess Kozriak. Yeah, um, there's a lot of experiments that go on. It's an amazing system. Um, it's great because there is a lot of modeling that goes on at the St. Anthony Falls Lab. And we have a facility that you can go out and test model results right there. And like I mentioned, I mean, it's hard. You need some kind of field setting in order to test these things. But you can't just go out and modify natural environments. Usually people, there's protocols against that. But the outdoor stream lab, you can modify very easily and it's set up for a lot of experiments. So yes, talk to Jess afterwards if you're interested. Yes, Jess will put in a stool right now for it. Oh, oh, I thought you were going <laughs> to. There's Jess. Talk to her. All right. Any last questions? We have a few minutes. All right. Should not have worried so much about time, I guess. <laughs>